dish of this demonstration uh, is called cottage pie. And we do start off rather as we did with the other one, and that is at the cooker, dripping already in the pan, and one onion. But this time the onion has been chopped finely because we're wanting it to cook. Um, one small onion should be enough to get a lot of flavor. It does become plenty. Just spread it round in the dish. 
make sure the saucepan's pretty clean, and then that's all ready, except for the mashed potato that goes on the top of it. Now, the potatoes have been cooked already, and those are here, just keeping warm on the stove. Now, I did measure out the potatoes for this, just as we measured out the flour for the sauce, um, to be sure that we had the right quantity. So it's one and a half pound of potato weighed after they've been peeled. I think it's a rather good habit to get into, uh, to weigh ingredients. It's not always necessary, uh, but sometimes it's all the difference between success and not quite success. Now, the potatoes will have a good flavor all their own, but it's worthwhile, I think, um, adding something else to them just to make a change. And we're going to use some Heinz tomato ketchup. And the quantity for one and a half pounds of potato will be just about two tablespoons full. I'm trying to do this very carefully, not to have it, not to have the tomato jumping out. But don't worry, if it does jump out, it does me sometimes a um, little extra work in this particular case. Now we're not going to stir tomato ketchup very carefully, lightly, so that when it's piped over the pie, it will have um, a rather speckled effect, and you'll see what I mean in a few minutes. Our uh, piping bag here is all ready with the vegetable pie in at the end, and I've chosen the rose one because it does make quite a nice pattern uh, when the potato is finally piped. Now, uh, it's worthwhile folding the top of the bag down so that you do get the potato going as far down as possible uh, into the bag. It's much quicker than having too much potato at the top, uh, and it's inclined to jump out of the top instead of the bottom, of course. But give a good shake each time to make sure that it does go right down. Oh, now, the piping bag can be used for all sorts of cookery, not only for potato in this case, uh, but for eclairs and other biscuit mixtures, uh, which I think we all like to try from time to time. Push the potato right down, give it a really good squeeze, one good turn, and it's ready to be piped on top of the meat here. Now, you can pipe this in all sorts of different patterns. Um, just a way to buy one, which I think is more effective. I think certainly it's more effective than just uh, forking the potato over the top, which is quick and easy, uh, but doesn't have quite the professional finish. And of course, it gives you an opportunity uh, to practice piping if you're interested in sugar icing. Um, this is a very good way to practice. And can you just see the speckled effect uh, from the tomato ketchup? Just makes a little variation, which I think the family might appreciate. Now, to make sure that this does get a good uh, finish to it when it's in the oven, we'll brush over the top lightly uh, with melted butter. These particular pastry brushes are quite good for this uh, kind of topping because they're very soft and pliable and they don't take out the nice ridges that you've taken too much trouble to put in. Now, the oven has been on 400 degrees for the liver casserole and that's the right temperature too for the cottage pie. It does take 25 minutes to warm through, only to warm of course, it doesn't need to cook. And to be sure that you could see the finished article, we did have one in the oven already. So we'll have this one ready to put in. We'll take out the one that has been cooking for us, or warming through rather, or, oh, I wonder where it is. So that's what's been going on behind my back. <laughs> At least you can all see how tasty it is. You teach them how to cook them and I'll eat them. Surrey, where time would seem to have stood still for centuries, and 
standing, a living symbol of its romantic past, is the White Hart, one of the few surviving hostelries in Old England and dating from 1388. But not content with merely looking the part, the proprietor here maintains the many traditional customs, like the cooking of jugged hare in this quaint old, believe it or not, pressure cooker. Most people are under the impression that pressure cookers are a modern invention. But in fact, this one, which cooks at a pressure of five pounds, is 180 years old and was designed specifically for jugged hair. Another gadget still used today by the proprietor, Mr. Sammy Matthews, is what most of us would say was a frying pan. If we did, we'd be wrong. It's an 18th century waffle iron. smoke, the pipe would be returned and baked clean in the embers of the fire for use again next day. If you fancy something more refreshing, what better than traditional mulled ale? Actually, the poker was specially designed for the job. Another important ingredient, as you can see, is grated nutmeg. Little ceremonies like these are part of the tradition that makes the old English inn a symbol of our heritage. Quiet, almost looks as if those birds are real. And yes, we've left Madame Field's studio. We're now in a butcher shop. Surely. But once more, it's hard to distinguish between a clever imitation and reality. Lovely grub. This certainly looks a well-stocked butcher's, only it isn't a butcher's shop at all. It's part of the restaurant in a famous Riverside Inn. The idea is you choose your meal and serve it up dinner by weight. You pick the cut you want, tell them how hungry you feel, or work out how much you feel like paying, and they cook it for you before your very eyes. The green grocery department works the same way. So fat and so tame that they'll feed from your hand. So catching these particular trout is reckoned a crime, but there's fish in plenty. And such things are smoked salmon are a matter of course to the students of good food who frequent this historic institution. There's another ancient custom zealously kept alive here, where so many eager scholars come to learn new things and meditate. Some say the most important process they learned at the university was mulling their ale. The Trotian has etched itself into the memory of generations of Oxford men, but not only scholars make up its company. Harry Worth and Peter Butterworth first became customers when they played Oxford in pantomime. If this is a seat of learning, they said, carve us a good thick slice of that venerable seat. Now, play the game. Remember, you are ordering your steak by weight. There's a tradition of decent sportsmanship in this club. The important thing is to see that the upper fellow hasn't gone and got that extra heavy steak you ordered. That's what you've got to watch. And look here, he has. He orders and he makes. He was so bad. He was so bad. Well, the landlord, Keith McKenzie, will tell you that Oxford education's in its infancy. To its most artistic use, the beating and rolling of bars of gold keeps one worth about pounds into the sheerest gold leaf. At this factory in Rice Lake, Middlesex, first stage is the casting of the gold bar. Most of us would be perfectly happy with just a bar of the stuff, but because of its brilliance of effect and remarkable durability, gold is put to more practical uses. 
And that gold bar we saw after being beaten by hammer is now rolled with increasing pressure into a ribbon 300 feet long and 1,000 of an inch thick and then cut into squares. This is an industry that goes back to the earliest times. In fact, gold beating by the Egyptians from 2 to 3,000 BC can still be seen untarnished and unbroken on money cases in the British Museum. Craftsmanship is still the key factor, and techniques have changed much. Except that today, gold is beaten to run less than the distance of ancient times, believe it or not, to more millionths of an inch. From original gold bar to the finished piece takes seven centuries involving several quartering and beating processes, so eventually laid side by side, the leaves from one bar would cover over 9,000 square feet. Every process requires skill of the highest order, but experts like the machine hammer foreman can check thickness from sight alone. Notice, by the way, that the leaves are protected by skins of vellum, specially made from the intestines of hops, and the whole lot enclosed in bands of parchment, making what is called... Work in every aspect of gold leaf is so precise and delicate that a hair's foot is used to an artist in cleaning the protective skins, which, because of the strength of the billions, are more valuable than the gold leaf they hold for beating. They may even smell from time to time to check their condition with a very good difference. It's clear it means the traditional skill of hand beating is no slower than the mechanized way, and considerably more precise. A man has to be apprenticed for several years before he's considered expert, and 77 year old Joe Woodward has been doing it for 63 and using the same amount of hand
Percy or Fredericks, but there aren't many of us who wouldn't take a leaf out of his book. One of those leaves. Now, here's one way to get curves. Another is to eat plenty of chocolate curvature, which, as you know, is French and means nice covering. of some rare liqueur because you're making really unique liqueur chocolates. See how it's done. There's a hot succulent toddy, the heart of a magical chocolate that is solid outside and inside, liquid and sweet. A liqueur that trickles round your tongue. You start the starch by absorbs just enough moisture from the sugar liqueur mixture to make the outside of it solidify slowly after it's been covered up. delicate shells at this stage, crammed full of mouth-watering tastiness. And there are other liqueur chocolates with something more solid as a heart, like those that are built round cherries that have been pickled in brandy for months and months. These cherries are oozing brandy from every pore, as one by one they're enclosed in a gooey fondant cream, and then left for another month to stew at their own delicious juice before they get the chocolate coating that you'll beat them in. Handmade chocolates. And see how they get their straight line finish one by one. No wonder they cost the earth. This is a unique factory. Things to the handmade perfection of yesterday. I over modern life and tastefully figured it out. A story out from the elite shopping crowds that throng this beggar's store. There are women up to their wrists in it. And the one by one treatment these sweet meats receive isn't over when they've been fashioned and cooled down. They're hand sorted, and after that, they're each and every one of them hand packed. A personal service, you could say. Of course, in the old world atmosphere of elegance that you still encounter here, where mass production is a cheap and ugly word, you get the self-same handmade feeling in the shop itself, on the display counter. These are the end products of craftsmanship in the kitchen. You could almost say, edible works of art. Every chocolate here has been made one at a time, the way a clever grandma used to make them. Mmm, that's probably what you've been wanting to do since we started this one. Ready to be fashioned into chocolate. When they have been cleaned and sent to giant hoppers, they're transferred in carefully weighed quantities to the roasters. In the big revolving ovens, the delicate flavor is developed by roasting. Besides time and temperature, the men know by years of experience when the process is complete by the aroma thrown off. The heat loosens the shell, which is thrown off by winnowing, and leaves the nib and the beef out 
other ingredients are necessary for chocolate. And in the mixer, this tipped sugar, correctly proportioned, of course, an extra amount of cocoa butter, in addition to that already contained in the nibs, and finally the nibs themselves. Now the mixture begins a series of refining processes in these huge granite rollers. These are conches, funny names but effective machines. The chocolate submits to this from one to three days, whilst the flavour is developed and perfect smoothness obtained. Now how does the cream get in the chocolate? Very simple. The moulds are filled with molten chocolate, and as they proceed, cream centres are placed in. What could be easier, or more tasteful? Farther along, the surplus chocolate is spread over evenly, and after cooling, the bars are turned out. A sort of time gentlemen, please, about it. Modern wrapping machines are amazingly clever. They handle the chocolate bars as dexterously as a conjurer, and as gently as a woman. Sorted chocolates, it's rather different. As the boxes move along, each girl places a chocolate in. Until by the time it reaches the end, the boxes are full. Yes, these are the boxes that single ladies get and the married ones dream of. Sweet rationing comes to a sticky end, and small boys everywhere hail the food minister their hero of the hour. At last, after nine years on personal points, Britain follows up the heat wave with the sweet wave. As zero hour approaches, the dawn patrol gathers outside the confectioners. Early birds get a special reward. Money boxes are rifled, and even father joins the queue. The longest memories find it hard to recall such days of plenty. Look how bad that stuff makes even grown up do childish things. The good news that draws old men from the chimney corner and children from play puts the fun back into being young. Tots mouths have watered a whole lifetime for this great day. For years they've been cheated by the hard fact of world economy from the unrestricted orgies once accepted as the birthright of every child. Sherbet and rock, gobstoppers and aniseed balls, lollipops and chocolate bars. And now for the tummy ache of a lifetime. Royal Appointed Bakery. Using a sweet milk dough made up with eggs and butter, they're making one of their famous plated loaves. This is the Sparrow Bakery where, in these days of mass production, Madame Floris, who came here from Hungary just 30 years ago, still makes 37 different kinds of handmade oven baked bread, feeding the men with wooden oven. The Queen's Royal Appointed Bakery. Using a sweet milk dough made up with eggs and butter, they're making one of their famous plated loaves. This is the Soho Bakery, where, in these days of mass production, Madame Floris, who came here from Hungary just 30 years ago, still makes 37 different kinds of handmade oven-baked bread, feeding them in with wooden oven peels. See just how tempting they look when they're out. And then see how they set about creating what they call harvest festival bread, the wheat sheep loaf. <laughs> These 
are the early stages in the process of making a hand-baked masterpiece, five times the size of a large loaf, a labor of love that links bakery back with the days of the simple farmer's life and home cooking. But how complicated it all is, what detailed and delicate work has to go into it. The whole thing is taking its final shape. But it's rare these days to come across craftsmanship in a bakery. Most bread now is steam cooked on conveyor belts. See what the wheat sheep looks like at harvest time. Now watch the doughboy experts work the elastic pastry that they use for apple strudel. Two pounds of dough must be light enough to cover 60 square foot of a baking table. If you can't read a newspaper through it, you've got your dough too coarse. <laughs> It's got to be wafer thin, and that yes. calls for experience. It's hard to remember what a flowery, kitchen-made material it is that he's working with. This is the conjurer's magic you so very seldom find in work day life. your chopped up apple and then wrap it up for baking like fish and chips that's a super saturated sugar solution ready to solidify like strands of candy floss as soon as it hits air watch it become sugar wool before your very astonished eyes gazing at this moment we're witnessing another spun out miracle and now it's ready to decorate a crocombus or a typical french wedding cake we've been wool gathering for a second time in quick succession <laughs> Yet the most attractive Marzipan cakes and decorations can be made at home with a simple assortment of utensils borrowed from the kitchen and the toolbox. This valuable advice from expert Paul Goff will raise the morale of many a housewife, emphasizing his theme. The whole process of covering any cake in Marzipan should only take the housewife or the man who finds it an intriguing hobby a half an hour.
firm touches needed for trimming the kick, although you can save a lot of time with little professional tricks like cutting through both sides together. One of Paul Goff's figures won him a gold medal at a world contest in Munich recently, yet his distinguishing feature is still simplicity. This knife handle technique might well be copied, and now the figure can be added piece by piece like this. Sweetmeat, why is a band today also makes an appetizing medium for the artist? And what's wrong with OHMS standing for on his missus's sideboard? All not all expert in artists in cookery shows you the possibility. In particular, it was moved in the decorative side of cooking. The sweets of life, so to speak. He's mixing the bites of eggs and the bands and having a stirring time. of some rare liqueur, because you're making really unique liqueur chocolates. See how it's done. There's a hot, succulent toddy, the heart of a magical chocolate that is solid outside and inside, liquid and sweet, a liqueur that trickles around your tongue. You start by pressing out molds for the master liquor in trays of warm starch. absorbs just enough moisture from the sugar liqueur mixture to make the outside of it solidify slowly after it's been covered up. See, the delicate shells at this stage, 
Royal Chandelier's master. And all its fuel is covered at Olympia. It's the 40th of the film exhibition the Daily Mail has put on. It was a brilliant conception when it began in 1908, and the interest goes on increasing. As gardens are a part of the ideal home, they're always a big feature of the exhibition. Here, a Belgian cacti garden. <laughs> Garden. About a million people will wander through before the month is over. Many will wonder how it has all been done. Many who are gardeners may go away in despair. Finally, some houses. Prominent are some that get right away from conventional architecture. And of them, perhaps the most striking is the Daily Mail house called An Adventure in Design. The upper floor is planned to catch all the light that's going. Very important in a country like ours, where the light seldom dazzles. Bathrooms go on getting better every year. They can be improved inexpensively, but it's nice to have a peep at one where money's been no object. Half an hour on the phone and she'll be in the water. The ideal home, the world's loveliest dream, and the world's biggest chandelier sheds light on the subject. The kennels are silent. The champions have conceived the fiberglass fantasy, which will dominate one of the halls. The designer can at this stage appreciate the fairy tale effect of the unique architecture. His model will eventually span 8,000 square feet of the Grand Hall. The countdown continues, and the sketches which for weeks have dominated the offices of organizers Ken Corney and Trevor Smith gradually blossom into reality. The infinite planning and detail of 12 months is emerging as exciting shapes, but there's still a long way to go. The race is really on. Houses built to last a lifetime will be reduced to rubble within a month. Yet during that period, more people will pass through than could normally be expected in a hundred years. So the upstairs has to be strengthened and reinforced. And there's a luxury swimming pool, a sunshine memory for the nearby sand artists who have brought their skill from the Canary Islands to an exhibition hall in West London. Sand pictures from Tenerife, yet it's pulverized lava of varying colors which is sprinkled meticulously on the chalked outlines. Olympia never had a finer carpet of color. The village fills Olympia with a suburban atmosphere as lorry loads of earth precede the invasion of nature. Hundreds of trees and shrubs have to be transplanted in the final hectic days of preparation while every bulb and flower is buried in an individual pot. Rock pools are created almost overnight. Thousands of gallons of water will ripple across the boulders in an out-of-season springtime scene, which unbelievably is just a blueprint of nature. Hours now seem to tick away like minutes. Decorators, carpenters and electricians work side by side, although patience still guides the hand of the sand artist as the floor pictures near completion. It's an unusual art gallery for the craftsmen who normally decorate the Tenerife streets on the feast of Corpus Christi. There is no time limit on such delicate artistry. And the only brushwork involved comes when the designs are swept aside to provide space for a fresh start. 
All this in a corner of a garden, which never feels the warmth of a sunshine smile. Nature doesn't wait for opening dates, so only at the last moment do the gardens get a final blanket of blossom. Even a stitch in time cannot be hurried by the needlewood working on the embroidered panels to commemorate the Battle of Hastings. of British history is being sewn into 27 panels by the Royal School of Needlework. Twelve have already been completed, but you can't go. Once you've settled on that ideal home, you want somewhere to build it. Today's trend is to buy a slice of Caribbean sunshine and pack yourself off to paradise. Maybe only a few of Olympia's million-plus visitors will gamble on a dream world. The majority will, as always, come to wander, stare, touch, buy and sample. Yet how many of those will stop and wonder just how it all began? Because even now, it's hard to realize that three weeks ago, all this was 12 acres of emptiness. <coughs> Deep in the heart of the country, that is the achievement of the 43rd Daily Mail Ideal Home Exhibition at Olympia. The Queen herself is abroad. So this year, the exhibition was opened and previewed by Her Majesty the Queen Mother. Gracious living of today and hints of an even better tomorrow will meet the eye everywhere in the next four weeks. Well over a million people are expected to visit the ideal home. From the overcrowded drawing rooms of Victorian homes, a long way we've come. Just how far, we don't realize until memories of the old times are revived as they are here. Refreshing contrast to the modern bathroom, and no doubt an equally refreshing contrast to the modern girl. Today's status symbol, the sunken bath. To descend to mundane matters, washing up. With a dishwasher, a drudgery no longer. I'm lucky the husband whose wife has one. Wiping a sing of the past. Many a mangled bird and joint has cried out for the electric carving knife. It's perfect for both the toughest and tenderest meat. If required, it'll cut wafer-thin slices. Lots of exciting furniture nowadays comes from Scandinavia. From Denmark, an ingenious extendable round table finished in teak. An ideal arrangement a decorated fiberglass screen conceals the sink unit till one. But away from the small flats and space savings to the luxury of the spacious modern house we should all like to have. Not even the British climate matters here. The private swimming pool is undercover, the water heated. Save up if you're a male, marry the right man if you're a girl. Something to strive for, the ideal home. The modern kitchen reveals some very novel gadgets. This toast rack, for instance, with a spring that holds firmly the thin, medium, or doorstep variety. The new butter pat maker has a plunger, which when pressed ejects a neat pat of butter, if you don't forget to put the butter in first. A double-purpose knife, with a saw-edged blade for cutting and a round, flexible end for spreading the caviar, if any. You know how easily you can break an egg by dropping it with a sickening thud into a saucepan? Well, this device puts a stop to that. Like that. Simple, isn't it? And the old timer's nowhere when it comes to timing eggs. The new timer looks like a lighthouse, probably as a warning when it's misty, or rather musty. It's graduated to five minutes, and the sand runs back at once. If, while the egg is cooking, you want to pop into Mrs. Jones's to ask if it's true what they say about Mrs. Smith, you just set the alarm, and when you've come to the most interesting bit, off it goes. And why didn't someone think of a sieve in a saucepan before? When pouring off the gravy or the soup, the solids remain, without the trouble of using another hand or a fork. Here's an eye-opener in the shape of a tin-opener, or rather a lid-loosener. 
A turn of the handle and it holds the lid in a vice-like grip. Sarajevo, where soon the assassination of his will spark off the First World War. <laughs> 